Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and I'm going to give you five cases in just a little bit over five minutes. For each unknown case, I'll show you each slide for about 10 seconds. At that point, you can pause and examine the images further if you'd like. Then I'll review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move on to the next case. We only have five minutes, so let's go. Case one, slide one of two. Slide two of two, CT scan. All right, so we're looking at an image of the right upper quadrant. Here's the liver. And you notice that there's this marked poster acoustic shadowing here, complete darkness. And there's also some mechagenic material here. And you may wonder at first, are we just looking at physiologic bowel gas at the gastroduodenal junction with shadowing? Well, gas will shadow in a much more hazy or dirty fashion, not this complete darkness of post-acoustic shadowing, and that's due to ring down artifact. This is actually a gallbladder completely filled with gallstones, yielding the wall echo shadow sign. And you can see that sign. Here's the gallbladder wall. Then you have these echogenic jagged echoes corresponding to the surface of the gallstones completely filling the gallbladder. And then, then you have the post-acoustic shadowing, so the wall echo shadow sign. And that's something to be careful of because when the gallbladder is completely filled with stones, it can sometimes be harder to see because it's almost completely shadowing out. So just look for that complete darkness of post-acoustic shadowing, not typical for the hazy, dirty shadowing of bowel gas. And this patient also had a CT scan. Notice how the gallbladder is completely normal on CT in this case. I put this in here to trip you up a bit, but also remind you that most gallstones are not visible on CT scan. It's only the calcified and the gas-containing gallstones that you'll see on CT scan, sometimes also the very densely pigmented stones. So just be aware of that. All right, next case, case two, 76-year-old female with ovarian serous adenocarcinoma, slide one of two. Slide two of two, CT scan. All right, so whenever you have a female patient with a history of ovarian carcinoma and you see ascites, which is what we have here, you want to be concerned about potential omental or peritoneal carcinomatosis. So we see this anechoic fluid in the anterior abdomen corresponding to ascites. This echogenic haziness anteriorly just is artifact, that's reverberation artifact. And notice that there's this lobulated, solid-appearing mass-like region anterior to the bowel. Here are some bowel loops posterior to that area, these fluid-filled areas. And when we add color Doppler, there's actually flow within it. So this is very suspicious for omental carcinomatosis. The patient also had a CT scan confirming the diagnosis. Here is this globular omental carcinomatosis we see anteriorly, and again, the ascites. So this was metastatic serious adenocarcinoma with omental carcinomatosis. And this is a typical metastatic pattern for this type of ovarian cancer. Mucinous cystadenocarcinoma will tend to metastasize with the pseudomyxoma peritonei pattern, where you might get scalloping against the liver. Uh, but you can also get carcinomatosis with that diagnosis as well. All right, next case, case three, history of trauma, palpable lump in the left scrotum, slide one of two. Slide two of two with color Doppler. Okay, so here we see the normal appearance of the epididymal body, but then the epididymal tail is heterogeneous and enlarged, almost mass-like. There's also some trace fluid there, a small hydrocele, and then there's the normal left testis partially imaged. So whenever you see an epididymal mass or an area of heterogeneity, you want to add color Doppler imaging, and you see it's extremely vascular. And given the history, and the patient also had fever, this was focal epididymitis involving the epididymal tail. So in general, epididymitis usually starts at the tail and then progresses to involve the body and head. And it can occur after trauma, just due to the trauma itself causes a form of epididymitis. But then you can also have superinfection. So this is post-traumatic focal epididymitis. Case four, slide one of one. Okay, so we're looking at four images of the uterus, and the myometrial architecture is extremely heterogeneous. There's also very poorly defined margins of the endometrial stripe with the myometrium, as well as this characteristic pencil-thin Venetian blind shadowing. If you look closely, you can also notice that there are multiple small little anechoic 
cystic foci with posterior acoustic enhancement. And this lower image shows very nicely these echogenic striations of endometrium extending out into the myometrium, infiltrating tendrils into the surrounding myometrium. On color Doppler imaging, we don't see any mass-like vascularity, but there is overall mild increased vascularity with the somewhat tortuous penetrating vessels. So this is very characteristic of adenomyosis, when you have ectopic endometrial glands and stroma extending out into the myometrium, causing this muscular hypertrophy. These patients often have pelvic pain and menorrhagia. Also, there is incidental uterine retroversion here, not specific for adenomyosis. All right, last case, slide one of one. All right, we're looking at images of the right kidney, and there is hydronephrosis here with dilation of the collecting system. So whenever you see hydronephrosis on ultrasound, you do want to try to find the cause. And in this case, we see an echogenic focus within the proximal ureter at the ureteral pelvic junction, causing posterior acoustic shadowing. There are calipers on it showing a measurement, so that's how you know it has to be real. <laughs> and this is right hydronephrosis caused by an obstructing proximal ureteral calculus. Now, what are some things you could do to increase stone shadowing? Well, one thing you can do is to make sure that the focal zone here is lined up perfectly with the stone. Here it's a little bit low, but we still get decent shadowing. You can also narrow the sector beam width here, and you can add harmonics. Those three things will all improve poster acoustic shadowing. Something that's a bit more labor intensive that you can also do is switch to a higher frequency ultrasound probe, because as you increase frequency, you increase resolution, but decrease beam depth penetration, increasing shadowing. On this right upper hand image, you see that there is this colorful artifact overlying the stone, and that's twinkling or twinkle artifact that occurs when you add color Doppler imaging to a highly reflective interface like a renal stone. And there are also techniques you can use to maximize that artifact as well. You can again manipulate the focal zone. So unlike poster acoustic shadowing, instead of lining it up directly with the region of interest, you can actually move it distal to or posterior to the area that you're trying to maximize twinkling artifact. We didn't do that in this case because it wasn't necessary, but that's a technique you can use. Also, you can increase the color Doppler scale, which is this number here. That's also known as the pulse repetition frequency. That will maximize color twinkling artifact. And for those of you who only believe things when you see it on CT scan, this patient did also have a CT showing the right hydronephrosis, the perinephric stranding with a stone here in the proximal right ureter. All right, that is it for five cases in five minutes, ultrasound number two. As always, you can subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on both Apple Podcasts and YouTube, where reviews and comments are appreciated. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for additional info and to follow us on social media. Thanks and have a great day.